This will be the uh, the the last lecture we're going to do on on multi-version concurrent control. And again, today we're going to focus on on garbage collection because that's super important for an MVCC database system. Um, so we've sort of already covered this in the last two lectures, but let's go into a little more detail what's what's actually uh, is going on. So the reason why obviously we need to do garbage collection in an MVCC system is because we have to identify uh, physical versions that are reclaimable um, and then remove them, right? Because otherwise we'll just run out of space. I think I said in the beginning that uh, with time travel queries, Postgres, when it first got, when it first was created in the 1980s, they didn't do any garbage collection at all because they said we wanted to support time travel queries. I mean, you can go do queries on snapshots of the database as they were back in time. And of course, in the 1990s, when people actually really started using Postgres outside of academia, the first thing they did was add back garbage collection because you run out of space pretty quickly uh, if you have a lot of churn in, in your database. So, so, it's, so it's sort of obvious why we need to do this. So our definition of a claimable is going to be a physical version where there's no active transaction that's running in the system that can see that particular physical version, meaning it's not visible to that, that transaction under snapshot isolation. Or obviously, if the version was created by the aborted transaction, we don't want that sitting around forever, and we want to go ahead and clean that up, right? So the great thing about multi-version current control, uh, because we're recording those timestamps in order to provide snaps to isolation, that we can just use all those same timestamps to determine when, uh, when tuples are actually visible or not. Right? And the idea here is that the, the timestamps we're using to assign transactions to understand their, uh, their global ordering is the same timestamps we'll use to deter, you know, in, in marking versions or the lifetime of of physical versions, and we just say, all right, if no one can see this, then we go, want to go ahead and remove it, right? So one thing we need to talk about, though, is, and what was in the paper you guys read from, from the Hyper team, is this notion that, like, the, the complications that, that are going to arise if you now start having transactions or queries that run for a long time. Again, remember I said, in, in the OLTP environment, the transactions are almost always short-lived, right? Update Andy's account on Amazon, commit that transaction, and you're done, right? And so in that world, updating those versions, uh, the transactions that need to maybe read those old versions, they're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not sitting around for a long time. So it's not like uh, there's a long-running transaction that needs to see the version of the database as, as it existed an hour ago. In a pure OLTP environment, we, we don't have that issue. But now it's when we start throwing in the analytics uh, workload and the analytical queries, then then we have to care about this, right? Because again, un under snapshot isolation, I need to see only the versions of, of the, the tuples that existed uh, by, or that were created by transactions that committed before I started. So if I, my query is going to take an hour, then I need to see the snapshot of the database as it existed for that entire hour. Now I can run under lower isolation levels like read uncommitted, then I just read whatever I want, who cares? But if you want to provide SNAPs to isolation, then, then you need to do this, all right? So again, the issue is going to be what we talked about in the first lecture about what, again, what I call traditional garbage collection. That was like, all right, I look at my timestamp and uh, I, of all my active transactions, and if anybody, if any version is less than the smallest active transaction timestamp, then I know, I, I know I can go ahead and prune it. But now if I have these queries that are sitting around for an hour, then that's going to be, you know, that's going to be a long get amount of time. Yes? Why do people want to run such long-running read-only transactions for, like, yeah. like, why not just, like, just say, yeah, we'll get some little noise in our data, like, that's good enough? Yeah, I don't remember if I covered HTAP in the, um, in the in intro class. Um, so there's OLTP and OLAP, and in the, in the t 2000s, people basically figured out, oh, you actually want to have specialized systems for each of these, and then you can run your OLTP queries on this database, and your OLAP queries in this database, and that way they have different uh, design choices, different goals, and you can build a system that's optimized for both of them. This HTAP stuff is a bit newer concept, hybrid transactional analytical processing. Uh, and the idea here is that I want to be able to run analytical queries as soon as data arrives. So instead of waiting for me to use some kind of ETL process to offload it from the, the LHP side into another database system, I want to run it on as immediately as it shows up. 
So that, that's a more common thing now, right? Because the, the longer it takes for me to go figure out, like if you're playing a game and I want to you know, trick you to, to buy crap, uh, if I have to run the analytics on my backend machine and it takes a long time for that data to get transferred over, then I may lose out on the sale. I guess like, well, why do we care about like, maybe like running under snapshot isolation? Like, what's the uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so his, his, he has a perfectly good uh, 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 statement. It's like, all right, well, for these analytical queries, do we really need to run under snapshot isolation? Could we just run at a lower isolation level? And is that good enough? In many cases, yes. Uh, and so this is sort of a, um, this is sort of a, uh, how do I say this? Um, a perception in academia that is actually slightly different, or it actually is quite different than what actually happens in the real world. So in the academic world, we would say, oh, of course you want to run on serialized well, isolation or snapshot isolation. But then in the real world, most people run it like read committed because that's the default you get in Postgres and MySQL, right? So yes, there are, uh, there are some cases where yes, you do want snapshot isolation, you do want serialized well queries, but for this analytical stuff, most of the time you don't need this. But even then, like, it, it, it does occur enough that we have to solve the problem. All right. Yeah, we did a survey uh, of DBAs two, three years ago, and we basically said, look, like 50 to 60 percent of all the papers in Sigma out of VLDB, they assume transactions run at serializable isolation. But then you ask real DBAs, and like, uh, like 10 percent of their transactions run at serialized isolation. Everybody runs it recommitted because that's the default you get in 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 real database systems. And those who don't bother to change it, unless you know what you're doing. So, uh, I, I say that snapshot isolation is. It was the bare middle you would actually want to have for analytics. You probably almost no, never want to have like serializable analytics. It doesn't make sense. Snapshot isolation is good enough. Okay. Actually, yeah, it doesn't make sense. If it's snapshot isolation, then I see everything as committed. That's I can't have any anomalies because I'm not doing writes as well. So yeah, snapshot isolation is like the highest you would ever want to go. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I sort of already covered this, but. Uh, what are the problems of having these old versions? Again, assuming we want to achieve snapshot isolation for our anal analytical queries. Right? Obviously, we are increasing our memory usage because now we're creating new versions uh, and our version chains are getting longer, but we can't reclaim that memory. So the, the, you know, the, the, the amount of storage space that our database system is, 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 is consuming or using just keeps growing and growing infinitely. Right? But now that also means that if we have to now if we can't reuse the memory that from older versions because we can't recycle the, the, the space, now we've got to go back to the allocator and potentially go back to the operating system uh, through malloc and ask it for, for more memory. And that call is not cheap and is not free. Like going to malloc and asking for more memory is definitely will come a bottleneck if you have a lot of threads doing this at the same time. Our version chains are going to get longer. Again, that means for transactions that have to traverse the version chain to find the right version that they want, then they're going to take even longer. Now, if you're doing newest to oldest, and most of your OTP transactions are just touching the, the newest version, right? this is not that big of a deal. Uh, for the analytical queries, yes, they have to traverse the whole chain to maybe find the right version. Um, the only system that I, I know that does oldest to newest is, is, is Hecaton, so they would have this problem. Um, but if you, do, you know, so if you do an oldest and newest, then it's a long traversal to put the new one at the end, that's only a problem in Hecaton, but for analytical queries, it takes longer for them to find the right version they want. Another big issue, which we haven't really talked about so much, is this notion of having consistent performance and stability in, in your database system in terms of performance. Um, if now you have like these long running queries for an hour, and then the hour, the query's done, and now you need to go back and clean up all the old versions that are finally, re finally reclaimable, well, now you're going to have this huge spike in the CPU usage for your garbage collection threads because they're going to say, oh, look at all these versions I can go clean up. Let me rip through that and, and you know, uh, start throwing them away. And now queries that are running at the same time, they might not have a dip in performance because now there's contention on the CPU for resources because <coughs> you're doing garbage collection. All right? So again, like a lot of times in, in the real world, a lot of companies or organizations, they're, they're very conservative with... Uh, taking on new, new, new technology for databases because they want to have consistent performance. It doesn't help you to say like, all right, here's the latest, greatest version of a new database system and it's going to make 95% of my queries go, go much faster, but then 5% are going to be like randomly slow. People aren't going to want that. They're, they'll stick with the old stuff that they actually know. 
All right, and then the last one is going to be an issue when we start doing, uh, when we talk more about, about cache locality and other things, so, and compression. So, if I now have all these old versions scattered around in my, my table space, then when I start doing, uh, if I'm doing this the garbage collection all at once, now I have a bunch of holes in my, in my, in my table that I can refill with other, other objects, but when I want to do compression, I want to basically get a bunch of old data and compress it down because it's, it's read-only. Uh, if my, all the versions are sort of scattered around because I can't keep reusing the same space over and over again, then I lose this locality and I have to do a bunch of extra work to, to combine together objects that are related to each other within time and that way they can be compressed. This won't make sense right now. I'll, I'll cover this at the, at the end of the lecture, okay? All right, so uh, for today, I want to spend a little bit of time at the beginning talk about talk about the issue about deletes. So this is something we didn't cover um, in the last few lectures. I should have, but it's, it's in here now. And then we'll focus on the, the different design decisions you have for garbage collection, which is in the hyper paper you guys read. And then uh, we'll talk about block compaction, which is the, the thing I was saying about combining together uh, unused space across the, uh, the data tables in order to you know compact, compact, or combine them together and free up memory. And then I'm missing the, the bullet point here, but I'll finish off in doing a tutorial on perf, which is what you'll need to do for project one, okay? All right, so um, we've talked about doing inserts, we talked about doing updates. We didn't really talk about how to do deletes. So inserts are easy, right? It's, it's the first physical version of a tuple. I find a free slot in, my, in my, my data table and I just insert it, right? No big deal. And then updates we already know how to handle, right? Depending on what version scheme we're using, right? Whether we do delta records or the append only, whether you know, what direction the version chain is, we know how to handle that. Deletes are a little bit tricky now because uh, you need to basically record now that this, this, phys or this logical tuple has been deleted and that even though someone may come along and insert that same tuple all over again, that's technically now in another snapshot and you don't want to reuse the version chain. And so basically you need a way to record to say, all right, well, this thing is, 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 is now deleted. Uh, no other version should, should come behind it, right? So again, we can't have any write-write conflicts because it's only the first writer wins. So if my transaction deletes this tuple before I, you know, before I commit, you try to update it, I'll, I'll beat you. So we, we need to have the same sort of uh, correct, uh, correctness semantics as, as before, right? So the question is now, how are we actually going to record that our tuple was logically deleted at some point in time, right? Because we can't delete the version chain because that's, you know, then, then they, its existence is gone, right? So there's two basic approaches to do this. Uh, the one is you maintain a separate flag somewhere that says that this logical tuple has been deleted. Um, and so you can either just store this now in like the tuple header that we talked about before where we record all those timestamps, or you can just have a separate column that's just a bitmap field that says the, the tuple within our block uh, at this offset has been deleted. So that means now when I start scanning or, or my transaction starts reading the database, I always have to check this thing first to see whether it's actually, you know, whether I'm going down a path that, that's, that's not deleted or not. All right? So in our system, we store it as, as a separate column. It's a separate bitmap field. All right? The other approach is to do a tombstone tuple. And the idea here is that we store a, uh, a new physical version, a special physical version at the end of the version chain, or you know, at the beginning of the end, depending on what, what direction we're doing. And then so somehow to indicate in, that, in this special version that it's representing that this tuple was deleted. And then that, you know, store all the timestamps and everything you would do before, and that gives you now information about, say, when this, when this tuple was actually deleted. So anybody that comes prior to that in an early snapshot, please st still see the older versions. So one way to sort of improve this or make, make this work nicely, instead of having sort of polluting all of the, uh, or instead of wasting space in your fixed data pool, you could have a, a separate data pool uh, to store these tombstone tuples because you don't actually need to you know, store the whole tuple. And then the version chain now just points, points to this thing. And you would look and say, oh, well, this bit set uh, there's some bit pattern inside it that says, oh, this is actually a tombstone tuple, not a regular tuple. This is only really the issue if you're doing a pen only. Right? So again, think about this. If, I am, if I'm doing a pen only and I have a thousand columns, if I delete that tuple and I want to create a tombstone tuple, 
Well, one approach is I now make a, a special tuple in my same table with all my other tuples for that table that has a thousand attributes, so that's wasted space, just to record that that thing was actually deleted. Or I can have a marker that says, hey, you know, uh, or have a special tuple space to say, this represents a deleted tuple. And that can be shared across different tables because we're not storing any attributes in the tombstone tuple. We're just, it's a marker to say this thing was deleted. So in Peloton, in our, I would say not beloved, but whatever, the old system we killed, uh, we did it this way. And we would use this special pool because we were doing a pen only like in Hecaton. And therefore, if we now create a tombstone tuple, if we put it in the th same data table, it'd be a big waste of space. In the newer system, uh, we, use, we use a separate column as a, as a deleted flag. Yes? Why do there need to be different tombstone tuples for each deleted table? This question is, why doesn't there need to be a, oh, sorry, d different de de uh, tombstone tuples for deleted tuples or, or for different tables? Like, even for different tables, and so like, even if I delete three tuples, mm -hmm. why do I need a separate tombstone tuple for each of them? Oh, right, so the question is, if I delete three tuples from the same table, why do I need a separate tombstone tuple for each of them? Because in the tombstone tuple, you're recording the begin and end timestamp. Because I need to know when was this thing deleted. Now, you, I think your other question too was, well, why do I need to have, why can I have a, a why can I have a same uh, tombstone table, special table, that can be shared across multiple data tables? Because we are not storing any attributes in the tombstone. The tombstone just says, hey, you're dead at this time. So it doesn't matter what table it, it corresponds to. Yes? Why not store it like in like the, like the last non-deleted version, like the next version is deleted or something like that? Uh, like essentially have like a little bit flag in like, essentially you have some flag in every, in every tuple that says like, okay, is the next version deleted? And so you say like- But you need, you need to know the timestamp. But you know your end timestamp. Uh, so yeah, you're back on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, I think, I think part of the issue is going to be that uh, first writer would win, so who cares? The market is deleted. I, there might be some ordering issue of like, can I record that it's been deleted, and then I just have to go. Yeah, if I do that, then if my transaction that deleted that tuple aborts, then I got to go make sure I go back and remove that. If I don't modify the the, the previous tuple other than just maybe the pointer, then when, when, I, when I abort, I still have to update the pointer. Yeah, you might be able to get away with something like that. I have to think about that. Oh, yeah. If it was, if it was the student that built this piece of the system, uh, it's not that he liked to cut corners, but he basically did everything in the most, most efficient way but possible, which is always not the best engineering approach. So if there was a way to make that work, I, I would, and like do that hack you're proposing, I suspect he would have done it. But we can take it offline and maybe do it on the board and figure out why that would or would not work. Okay, again, so again, for this one, I don't think anybody does this uh, other than us, because if you're doing Delta Store, uh, eh, the Delta Store would do the same thing. But if you're doing newest to oldest uh, uh, with a Delta Store, then this doesn't buy you anything because you do store in the, in the, the header for that tuple that thing's been deleted. Yes? What if we just update the end timestamp? Well, that was his state question. It's like, what if I just update the end timestamp? Would that be enough to denote that it was deleted? I still have to have a flag somewhere that says this thing was deleted. Uh, but if, if the end timestamp is updated, no uh, new transaction can access that version. Right, but, but you, it's an end, you need an end timestamp to represent that it, it was a special delete. Like, maybe put, you take the first bit and had that represented it was deleted. You could do that. If I just put an end timestamp in there, I, I don't know whether that's a delete or not, or whether it's actually a new version. Uh, but uh, the garbage collector would, okay, the tuple, okay, the, the ID was like, Yeah, was yeah, okay. All right. So, all right, let's now talk about different design decisions. So I wanna, this part wasn't in the paper, but I wanna talk about how we actually do uh, clean up keys from indexes, um, and then the, there's only really two papers on garbage collection for MVCC systems. I had you read the guys, from, the one from Hyper, uh, which actually just came out a few months ago. There's another paper from 2016 that I had the students read last year from the SAP team. Um, they're not, but, there it is. They're, they're both okay papers. The, what I don't like is that they sort of d define the same, 
define the same concepts but, but using different terms. Like I think like the, the hyper guys call things like precision and frequency, um, but they, you know, these guys call it like identification and things like that. Like, so the, the concepts at a high level are the same, just the, the, the nomenclature they're using to describe these things will be slightly different. So I may mix up as we go along some bits from HANA, the HANA paper and the hyper paper, but hopefully it should all sort of make sense. So let's talk about how we're going to track versions, the frequency with which we invoke the garbage collection, the granularity we're, we're going to look at uh, potential versions we can remove, uh, and, and how to compare whether it's, it's okay to prune them or not. Okay? All right, so for indexes, again, what's going to happen is that as my transaction runs, uh, and I'm creating new, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, cr I'm creating new tuples, I'm creating new versions, um, I have to store that in, in an index. Because now if I try to go back and read that same thing that I just wrote, I want to be, be able to go through the index and see my own writes. If you're doing OCC where there's a private workspace, you don't do this because you stage all the writes at the end. But the, and the, what we've been talking about is doing the timestamp ordering approach where you apply the writes in that, in that global space because that allows you to do speculative reads uh, for other transactions that are ahead of you in, in, in sort of logical time. So now the problem is going to be is that if I need to abort or if I need to go clean up versions, I need to make sure that I remove any keys that correspond to older versions that I, that I need to remove, right? So the way to basically do this is that while a transaction is running and it's updating the indexes, uh, we just need to record you know, what keys did we insert or, 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 or um, do we, we, we invalidate from our index because we're making changes. And then when we go to commit or abort a transaction, we have to have the garbage collector kick in and say, "All right, well, let me go clean up the uh, let me go clean up the the, the indexes because these are things that people shouldn't see, right?" So the way Hyper got around this was, anytime you would uh, you modify an attribute that's indexed, then you treat that as a delete followed by an insert for that tr for that transaction, because then you don't have to worry about going and finding the key and updating the pointer. Right, you just say, this, here's the old version from the key in the index, you remove it, and let me, and let me insert a new one. So we did not do this in, in Peloton. We did something really, really stupid, like retardedly stupid. I don't know why, this is one of those things where like, the student did it this way because it, it looked like it, it made performance go better for our benchmarks, and it wasn't until like, later on, we're like, all right, we've got to go modify this to fix some things. I'm like, oh my gosh, they did something bad. We, we shouldn't have done this, all right? So here's what we did in Peloton. So again, we were doing a pen-only uh, uh, oldest to newest. Is that true? Yes. And what would happen is if I have a transaction comes along and say they update A, right, and we set this key now to 22, well, I would do an append only, or I would append a new um, tuple into my table space, but then I would add a new entry in my index to say for, for key 222, here's the version of it. So even though logically uh, they're the same tuple, from the index's perspective, they look like separate things, right? So then we got into trouble was, what if we try to update the same key again on the same tuple? Instead of making a new entry in the index, we would actually go and overwrite the, the previous version that we created. So in this case here, I would replace 222 with now 33, or 333, and then now I would also have uh, update my index to now point to it as well. And I kept doing this every single time I, I did an update, right? So this sets us to 4.4, and I would have, again, update entry to point to here. So now the problem is when we go ahead and, and had to abort this transaction, we had no idea what was the other, you know, 222, 33 that we inserted. And so we could go delete 4.4 because we would know this is the version we need to clean up because that's what we're seeing in, you know, in our, our dirty table space or dirty, uh, dirty tuple list for our transaction but we had no idea that we left those other keys inside here. So we would run this for a while, run some benchmarks, and all of a sudden you'd get, uh, if it was a unique index, you'd get back an error and say that a key already existed, even though it didn't exist in the table because we were leaking these keys uh, from, from, you know, from aborted transactions. So, you know, this is embarrassing, this is stupid. Uh, you know, this is not really anything specific about, uh, you know, the paper you guys read. This is just showing that, like, it's hard to get these things right. Uh, even if you have the best intentions, and just not keeping track of all the keys that you update as, you know, or all the keys you, you modify in the index as you're going along, can end up, you can end up losing things. So again, we don't do this anymore. 
This is good. Okay. So let's talk about now how we're actually going to keep, find, uh, keep track of the versions that uh, transactions are going to create. Uh, There's a typo here, sorry. Um, so the, the first approach we sort of talked about, we first talked about these two in, in, the, in, in the first lecture on MVCC, right? And this is where we just have uh, some mechanism where a, a, the transaction threads or a separate garbage collection thread can go through our tables and identify uh, versions that we need to prune up, right? The background vacuuming was a, was a separate thread. The cooperative cleaning technique was where the transactions or the queries as they were running, if they noticed they had a version that was not visible to any transaction, then they would go ahead and clean that. So Hackathon did this because they were doing oldest and newest. So as transactions ran and had to traverse the version chain to get to the newest version, along the way they would see a bunch of old versions that they knew were reclaimable and they go ahead and remove them right there. Right? The transaction level approach is what we used to do in Peloton. Uh, and this is where transactions would keep track of all the versions that they created. Uh, and then when they commit, they handed off this information to the garbage collector, who then had a view on what transactions are running, what are their timestamps, and, excuse me, and then could identify which, which, you know, which versions that were invalidated by these transactions are now, are now prunable. Uh, the last approach is to an epoch based approach, and this is basically the same thing as transaction level. The idea here is you're going to execute a bunch of transactions and, and not as a batch, meaning all at the exact same time, but you put them under the, the same epoch. And this will make, we'll, we'll see this again on Monday when we talk about the BW tree. But basically, it's like this other counter that's always going forward in time, and we would know that when we go from one epoch to the next, we would know whether there's any transactions that could still be seeing something in the previous epoch. And then if not, then we know that anything that was, that was invalidated in that epoch can be reclaimed. We'll see again this more, we'll see more about, we'll see this approach or technique used in the, the beta tree on Monday when you read that paper. All right, so let's how to do the version tracking at the transaction level. Again, so my transaction comes along, gets timestamp 10, uh, I do an update on A, I create a new version, right? And then now, because I know that I had, this was the, the, the version that, the latest version that I saw, and then I created my new version, so therefore I know for this transaction, A2 is now uh, potentially reclaimable. So if my transaction commits, then I know I can go ahead and clean up A2. So I just record that in my, my transaction local space for my old versions. And this is just a pointer to uh, this location here. And this can work, these pointers can, we can use these pointers because we're not gonna end up, we're not moving this thing around, right? We're not doing compaction where we can be moving it from one block to the next. Like we just say that this thing has to stay there. Now I do a, uh, an update on B, same thing. I have the old version that I know that I created. Uh, I create my new version after the, the, the previous old version. I update that now in my, my old version list. Then when my transaction goes ahead and commits, I just pass this information along to the garbage collector who can then look at it and say, well, the commit timestamp uh, for this is 15. So I know for these versions here, anybody that's less than 15 uh, a time, a timestamp less than 15 uh, should be able to see them, right? So if now there is no transaction that has a timestamp less than 15, then I know that these versions are, are removable. Right, so this is called, I think, the, 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 the low watermark or the high watermark in the paper. Basically, I just need to know for, uh, for these tuples, what's the lowest timestamp I could have where someone can actually still see this. So if no transaction has something below that timestamp, uh, then I can remove it. Yes? See, uh, another transaction uh, with the timestamp means 10 was already running. Yes. And uh, it comes and leaves 8. So it should ideally be 8, right? His question is, if I have another transaction that's running that has a begin timestamp of what? 10. You can't because this guy already has 10. So 9. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> he comes along and he's going to read A. He would read this one, right? Because 9 is, is in, in between 1 and, and 15. Right? So yeah, he reads A2. But we, we said that we, we're going to... Uh, no, no. So again, the, the garbage collector knows, like, it knows what other... It has, you have to know what transactions are running. So in the hyper paper, they talk about how, how it's this linked list that's sorted by transaction ID, and you can just look at the head, or, right, depending on what order it is, to find out what the lowest one is. That's, like, that's the, the low watermark or the high watermark, depending on how you're looking at. And the idea is that I know what transactions are running. So if, I, if there's a transaction that's running with, with timestamp 9, then 9 is less than 15, so therefore, it could potentially still read these things, and therefore I can't reclaim them. It may never read B, 
but I don't know that because I don't know what the transaction is actually going to do. So I, I have to be conservative and leave everything, you know, leave it around. Correct. Like, and again, the, you could use the, the sorted linked list that the hyper does. You could just record a single value. There are different ways to do that. Okay. So the next question is, how often are we going to invoke the garbage collector? Um, and again, is this trade-off between if we're very aggressive in our garbage collection, then yes, we can go free up space as quickly as possible, assuming there's not transactions that are you know, sitting around with a long timestamp. Um, but the issue is going to be, uh, we'll, we'll reclaim space more quickly, but now we could be, end up slowing down transactions. Because now the garbage collection threads, if it's running in a background uh, uh, setup, they start using you know, the CPU, and that's going to eat up cycles and make your queries and transactions run slower. And obviously, if, we, if we're, too, uh, we're less aggressive and run this in too infrequently, then now we're going to have uh, a, a, the size of the database is going to get larger because we're not reclaiming versions as quickly as we maybe should. Um, the version chains could potentially get longer, and that means that it takes longer for queries to go find the exact version that they want. So it's a delicate balance between the two of these. I actually think the hyper approach is the better one um, than the background garbage collection. So again, the, so you run it periodically, you run it continuously. This is what hyper does, this is what we do. And this is what uh, most systems do. So periodically just means that at some fixed interval uh, or within, when some threshold is met, like if I have... If I know I have 20% of my memory is being used by, un, un, uh, by reclaimable versions, somehow I could compute this, then I kick off the garbage collector and, and go find things. Right? Sort of the JVM sort of does a similar thing. Like when you get to your heap size, when it gets by a certain percentage, then it kicks off. So this is just saying that, all right, again, I, I run it in the background thread and I'm running it every so often. And for some systems like in Hecaton, they can identify that if my load or my, if my churn rate for my versions is really high, then I can make this, uh, I can run this more frequently. The, uh, the, the hyper approach is to run this continuously where the, the garbage collection procedures are just a part of the normal transaction processing or query execution uh, steps, right? So in hyper, they did it on commit. So anytime a transaction committed, then they would have that thread go through and see, well, what, what can I reclaim? What can I clean up? Clean up? The, the, the Steam version in the, in the newer version of Hyper, this is do, just doing qu during query execution. So I call this the same thing as cooperative query execution, or cooperative cleaning, the way, same way Hecaton does, where just as I'm running my queries, if I see things that I need to clean up, let me go ahead and, and clean them up. But because Hyper is doing newest to oldest, they don't have the dusty corner problem that uh, Hecaton has, where you could have versions that are never visited and they never get reclaimed. Right? If, if, if you read it, you'll see it, and you can reclaim it. So I think I would like to do this, uh, although the way we're sort of, our system is sort of set up now, our garbage collector is integrated with this other sort of background cleanup process uh, that does a bunch of other memory management things. So I don't think we can switch over to this. I think we're stuck with this. But again, I, I like this better because it's like, all right, well, if I execute a lot of queries, I do a lot of updates, well, it's sort of, as they put it, self-regulating because if I'm creating a lot of versions, as I run queries, the, those queries will clean up the versions that, that are reclaimable. Um, and if queries run slower because I have a lot of versions to reclaim, well, that's actually going to then up, end up slowing down the rate in which I create uh, old versions. So I, I like that model. All right, so now the question is, how are we going to organize in, internally the metadata for our garbage collector to, to, to determine whether we, we can go ahead and reclaim things? Right, again, and now, again, there's more trade-offs between whether we're going to have sort of fine-grain tracking information to say, here's a single version that, that can be reclaimed within this timestamp, or whether we can combine them together and just sort of have a timestamp across multiple tuples, and that can amortize the, the storage costs of the tracking information for this in exchange for maybe not reclaiming things as fast as they possibly could be. So this is just everything I just said now, right? So single version tracking would be for every single tuple, I know what their version is and what their timestamps are. And then when the garbage collector kicks off, I can make a decision at that point to decide whether it's okay to reclaim stuff. So you get this sort of for free if you're doing the continuous or cooperative cleaning because as I scan along and my version chain to try to find the version I want, then I would end up uh, cleaning things up as I find them. And I'm already storing that metadata anyway in the headers of the tuples or the, or the records. 
So it's not like I need to sort this stuff uh, separately. The group version is what I showed before in that one example with the vacuum thread. And the idea is here is to say, here's a bunch of tuples that uh, were invalidated by a transaction at some timestamp. And so anything that less than that timestamp, uh, any transaction that has a timestamp less than this could still possibly see them. Otherwise, they don't. Right? So again, there's less overhead to track things, but uh, it may delay the, the time in which we, we can reclaim something and get memory back. So there's a third approach that was in the HANA paper uh, that you, didn't, you guys didn't read, but I think the, the hyper paper mentioned this, where you can actually do uh, reclaim all the versions from an entire table if you know that there's no transaction running right now that could ever access it. So how does this work, right? Because remember I said, here's one example, like there was a, could be another transaction at timestamp 9, could, it read A, it may read B, but we don't know because we don't know what queries that transaction is going to execute. But in some cases, if you execute your transactions as prepared statements or stored procedures, then you know potentially what all possible queries it could ever execute. Like a prepared statement is like a predefined function that you can install in the database system that runs some logic for a transaction, like, and it'll have invocations of queries. So you can see what all the queries are ahead of time. Not always, but sometimes you can if everything's pre-declared. So I can look at my stored procedures that are running as transactions in my system, and if I know what queries they could ever possibly execute, then I know what tables they're they'll, they will touch. And if I see that, they, are, that they're, they can never touch a particular table, then I can go ahead and reclaim all the versions for that entire table without doing any you know, fine grain tracking. In the case of HANA, they're doing the time travel storage so for a given table, all the versions are sitting around in another, you know, another table space. So I can just blow away that entire time travel storage space uh, without having to do any, you know, any examination of their timestamps. It's basically doing like a, a drop table and, and creating it again, which is super fast. <coughs> again, this is, this, is a, this is a, as I said, a special case or a corner case, right? If, if, your, transact if your application is, is invoking a bunch of stored procedures, then, then you can do this. Most systems do not do, cannot do this, though. Right? And I don't think if you're doing the delta storage or the append-only storage where the versions are mixed together uh, with regular tuples or as delta records, I don't think this actually would work. Right? This is sort of a special case for, for HANA, as I said. All right, the last thing we'll talk about is uh, how to determine whether something is reclaimable. Right? And ideally, what we want here is that in order, in order for our system to be scalable, then we, we want to be able to examine what are our active transactions and what are the reclaimable versions we can deal with. And we want to do this without having to acquire any latches. So this is what I was saying before. In the hyper paper, they maintain a latch-free linked list that I can keep sorted pretty efficiently. And I can use that to figure out what are my current transactions. So an important concept to also understand, too, is that unlike in when we're actually running the queries under snapshot isolation, where we can't have any false positive or false negatives right, of, of missing data we should actually see, and somehow we, we miss it. And for garbage collection, we actually can be a bit loosey-goosey here, and it's OK if we end up missing something. Right? So if, if my garbage collector runs, and at that exact same moment, another thread commits a transaction with a bunch of tuples that are reclaimable, a bunch of physical versions that are reclaimable, and if, you know, if I end up missing that, the garbage collector ends up missing that, during its pass of the, uh, you know, that, that current, current invocation, who cares? Because the next time I run around, then I'll, then I'll be able to see it. So we can use, we don't need to, you know, it, we don't need to have, you know, super tight protection over the critical sections of when we decide how to reclaim things. It's okay for us to, to, to maybe miss something, you know, at least once, and then the second time around we'll see it. So this now is the important part of the, 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 the one of the main, uh, contributions of the hyper paper, although they did not invent this, this interval stuff, it actually comes from the, uh, from the HANA paper. But it basically saying, how are you going to determine whether something is reclaimable or not? So for this one, for the timestamp, this is what they call a traditional garbage collection in their paper. This is just, again, I know what the minimum timestamp is for all my active transactions, and therefore anything less than, than that timestamp is not visible to any of those active transactions, and therefore I can go ahead and reclaim that. The interval approach is that is when we a bit more uh, m bit more crafty, and we can then now look at ranges of 
timestamps and identify if there's ver parts of the version chain that are not visible at all. And instead of actually waiting for to, you know, to take the oldest one out first and sort of prune it along in timestamp order, we can actually excise out that range that's not visible, reconnect the version chain, and things are, 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 things are perfectly fine because everybody can see whatever, you know, what they're supposed to see. So the tricky thing is going to be is how do we identify these ranges and how do we do the, the consolidation of our version chain to remove those, those invisible ranges. So let's say now we have a simple example like this. We have transaction one. He's going to read A, right? Transaction two is going to update A, all right? And so now we have an, an older version, or, or A1, that we eventually we think we, we're going to remove. This, this guy goes ahead and commits, which it does at 25. So now we have another transaction comes along, updates 30, and, and it commits at 35. So now at this point here, A2 is reclaimable because the only other transaction running is, is the first guy here. He's at timestamp 10. So he can never see 25 or 35. He can't see thir this A3 either, but on a snapshot isolation, he's not, he's not allowed to. So we have this, this guy here that we need to go ahead and remove. So if we're doing the timestamp comparison, then our garbage collector can't remove A2 because our high watermark, or the, the low watermark, the lowest timestamp of an active transaction is 10. Therefore, 25 is greater than 10, so we can't remove this. But if we're doing the interval-based approach, then we can reclaim this because the timestamp 10 does not intersect with the lifetime range of, of 25 and 35 for this version. 10 can never see this thing, so we can go ahead and, and remove this. So for this approach, if you're doing append-only storage, this is easy to do because all I have to do now is just update. If I'm going oldest to newest, I can just update the pointer for A1 and now point it to A3, and then A2 now is, is essentially missing, and I can go ahead and reclaim it. Right? Because everything I need to reconstruct the tuple to say what, you know, what is the version of this tuple at, at a particular timestamp, it's contained in the tuple itself. Because again, a pen only has all the attributes. This is now harder to do though, if you're doing delta storage, because you may not have all the attributes. So let's look at the example here. So say I have one tuple, right? It's a timestamp 60, uh, and then I have a, a long version chain like this. So I have now my first transaction. He's running at timestamp 15. So again, I need to see a versions of tuples as they existed uh, from committed transactions at timestamp uh, time 15 or less. So I can read A10 down here. My other guy here, he's, he's, he's going to read uh, uh, anything above uh, 55 and less. So that means that this basic chunk of, of tuples here are potentially reclaimable. Not 50, but all these other ones are, are here are reclaimable. But, but now the problem is because we're doing uh, delta storage, some of these are touching attribute two, some of these are touching attribute one. So when we do our consolidation, we sort of need to take, need, need to take a union and, of these different delta records and only have the latest version or latest modification to a particular attribute in our final compacted or consolidated delta record. Right? So in this case here, I update attribute two three times, 77, 88, 99. So when I create now my consolidated version, the latest version of attribute two is 99. And therefore, I can discard these other delta records here. But this guy down here modified attribute one, so I, I need to know that in order, to understand, you know, understand, in order to recreate the version of this tuple at timestamp 50. So I have to record that in my, my record as well. And then the timestamp I'm going to assign for this consolidated delta record will be the max timestamp of what I consolidated. All right? So again, now if I, you know, if I come along, this guy wants to read 15, uh, at times to 15, he can still get to A10. This guy wants to read at timestamp 55, he can still find this one. And it'll have all the information for all the delta records that occurred uh, after timestamp 50 here. So now to install it, right, well, I have the pointer to that, I just do a compare and swap on the version vector to now update it here. And again, first writer wins, we're treating this as this, you know, it's like an update, but it's like an internal update. So if somebody else comes to update this version vector while we're doing our, our consolidation, then we fail and have to restart. But let's say again, it succeeds. So now my, uh, my version vector points to this consolidated one, and then I can blow away the, the, the rest of the version chain. Yes?
The question is, do I require that these, re these things are committed? Again, under delta storage, first writer wins. The, it's either this is always going to be the committed version if the version vector is null, or the latest committed version is the first one. <coughs> Everything else is already committed as well, right? So it's not like this is like an in-flight transaction because nobody can, no one can create another, n no two transactions can create delta records on the same, same logical tuple because the first guy would be able to succeed. Yes, sorry. For doing a union, um, after you find the most recent version of one of the attributes, can you just ignore all the others and then go for, like you're just basically trying to find the most recent? Yeah, qu question is, how do I actually do the union of, or do the consolidation of these Delta records? So you would go back in time. So you would say, I know I have X number of attributes. And so I need to make sure that when I do my pass, as soon as I see, as soon as I see all, all the attributes, then I know that there's nothing else that, that, that I would care about that comes after this. And therefore, that's, I, you still have to process it because you, you still have to be able to say, these, you follow the version chain and say, this is what I'm going to reclaim. But you don't need to, you're not updating the Delta record, with the new Delta record with that information. So we did this as a class project last year. Um, I'm trying to remember why it was tricky. I think it's something in the ordering of reclaiming uh, variable length data that makes this challenging because you would have, like, this is showing the string embedded in the Delta record, but if it's a large string, then it's a, this is actually a pointer to the variable length pool. And I think we got into trouble of, of trying to get the order of that correct. Um, but this would be something we, we could potentially explore uh, again this semester. Um, the, it really, if you, you know, if you sort of do this project, it would really force you to think through like this verging information and what are all the corner cases? Like this is obviously an over oversimplification of the of the problem. So, okay, yes. Uh, for data records, uh, for garbage, for collecting garbage, yeah. first definitely need to compact it. Then only we can uh, then the garbage collector can run through. Your question is uh, for doing garbage collection on Delta records. Do we have to do this consolidation and compaction first, and then we can clean some? No. But then this, how do you know this, uh, the attribute one ID if you don't compact? So, how would you know attribute one? So, no, so, so if, if say I remove thread one, right? Uh, all I care about, like if, if, if I know that nobody else can read anything that comes after this, then they're always going to read the version up here. It's, I'm only doing this consolidation because I know that this guy here could read this, and I need to know what was the version that came after that, right? If I don't, if I, if I'm, not, I don't need to do this interval consolidation. Uh, it's a, it's a nice thing to have, but you don't need it for correctness, right? Because without it, otherwise, uh, without it, I have to wait for this guy to commit or be go away before I can then prune everything out. Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. So his question is, uh, do I really need to consolidate this? Couldn't I just, uh, like, essentially combine those three? Yeah. Ones? Remove these guys. Keep this one. And would that be enough? Yeah. That would actually still work too. It would lead to more point. It would lead to more point. No, because I think what he what he's saying is, right. So we're back here. So instead of consolidating into this new guy, I keep this, and I can remove these guys because those are overwritten by this. And all I do is now update this pointer now to this. Yeah, so you, that would work. Otherwise, you'll have only all both changes in one record. Now you have to go to a point there. Oh yeah. So, so yes, when I when I scan, I want to get back to see what the correct version is. Yes. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I don't think the paper covers, like, you can obviously de devise different synthetic benchmarks to exercise, you know, different update patterns. I don't know what real workers actually do, you know, to say one, one way is better than another. But when we did this last year, I think we, we, we created a new Delta record. And then the tricky thing was, <sighs> you create the new Delta record. Yeah, the, the tricky thing is, yeah, I remember this. The, the issue was going to be, this, these things are sitting in the, the, each of these Delta records are sitting in, the, in the, the thread local memory for the transactions that ran them. But then now the problem is going to be, 
uh, and, it, and it would be normally only the thread would reclaim that memory, but now you have this consolidation thread in the, in, in the background wants to be able to reclaim things and you have to like take latches on and protect the memory space. And it actually made it, things go slower. I don't remember the exact details of it. We, we have notes from 04. Okay. All right. So the, the next thing I want to sort of finish up with this discussion is in all these examples, it's sort of obvious that yes, reclaiming memory is a good idea, right? We, we want to get, you know, if it's, we don't need the data, we should go ahead and free up the space. But now the question is, what do we actually do with that memory we just freed up, right? Because let's say I have a, I insert a billion tuples and then I delete a billion tuples, what should happen, right? Should I give back the OS, that, the, the memory for that one billion tuples? Or should I give back some of it or just keep it all to myself? I think it's actually you want to be in, in the middle, right? I think you do want to keep some of it, but you do want to give some back, right? Because people would end up thinking their, their system is broken if I insert a billion things and then delete a billion things and the, the memory usage doesn't go down, right? So for the variable length data, data pool, we can always just re reuse the, the, the memory spaces, right? Because we're essentially doing a bin packing problem to find, you know, for every single new, new attribute we need to store in the variable length data pool, we just find a free slot and put it in there. For the fi fixed length data sl slots, it's a bit more tricky because, uh, if we start reusing the slots uh, for tuples, you know, as we need them, as, as we claim versions, then that could end up causing us the, the sort of, the, the temporal aspect or the temporal dimension of our data is now sort of randomized. So what do I mean by that? So like, say I have a, uh, I have an application where most of the time people touch the latest data. If you think like Reddit or Hacker News, most people only comment on the latest posts, right? Nobody goes back five months ago. I don't think it will even let you. It tries to update, you know, uh, write a comment on a post from five months ago. So that means that now if, if I am, if I ignore the multi-versioning stuff, if as I create new tuples for all these comments on these articles, they're, they're gonna approximately going to be located close to each other and have the same time. Because say I'm, I'm inserting a new comment, sort of going chron chronologically, they're all going to be related together or close together in the same amount of time since when they were created. Right? It's not like I'm going to go try to insert a comment from an article five months ago and now that's interspersed with, with articles from, from today. And so the reason why that matters is because in OGB workloads, the probability that your that, that tuple is going to be updated is depends on the, sort of the last time it was accessed or when it was inserted. So if, if, my, if my first version was inserted today, the probability I'm going to update it is, is higher today than it will be five months from now. Because right? most of the times you only, can only update the, the latest things. So if now within my blocks of data, if they're all roughly around the same, you know, created at the same time, right, the versions are created at the same time, then I know they're going to have the same probability that they're going to be updated and therefore get potentially invalidated. And so therefore, if I have data that's from five months ago all in one block, I can now compress it, make it read only, and not worry about having to go uncompress it to, to update something and then rerun the compression scheme all over again. Does that make sense? Like if, if data is located together, they're all created at the same time, therefore it's all going to be updated with the same probability, then I can use compression now to, com to reduce the size of that block of data and not worry about having to rerun compression later on. So you don't want to compress the newer things, you want to compress the older things because the older things are going to be read only. So, this is sort of the, the two issues. If I, if I reuse the slot any way that I want as I create uh, new versions and, 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 re and reclaim old versions, then in my physical layout on memory, it's going to be randomized, like some, some stuff will be new, some stuff will be old. And now if I go to compress it, if there's an intermix with old and new, if I compress that block of data, then the, there's something in there that could be updated and then I have to you know, uh, do compression all over again. So we lose that temporal locality. We could just leave, leave it alone and basically have these slots unused, the, these holes in, these, in the slots. Um, and this is bad because we end up, we end up, you know, we end up how much of holes and space that we can't, we can't use, but we're still allocated that memory. So at some later point, we have to go back and do compaction and, and sort of consolidate multiple blocks with a bunch of holes and, and you know, combine them together so that get, we get better, um, we get better util utilization and less fragmentation. Um, there's a third approach that's sort of tied to this, um, 
Like when you do truncate, the command truncate, truncate is basically a delete without a where clause, but you can special case, special case it because instead of having to scan through and, and delete tuples and basically examine them with, without a where clause and set them to delete, the easy way to do truncation is just, just drop table and then recreate it. Blow away all the indexes, blow away the table space and just recreate it. And that way you don't worry about any of this locality information or loca locality uh, attributes. It's just, you start from scratch all over again. But truncate, truncate is a special case. So now to do the compaction that I was talking about, yeah, sorry. For the five month example, why um, are we distinguishing between like the idea that you would compact them all together, but you wouldn't delete them all together? The question is for the, for the, the five month example, why am I assuming that I would not, that I would compact them all together and not delete them all together? Uh, you could, you would do both. So like, there's some websites where they only expose like the last 90 days of, of data to you. And essentially they're doing like a, a TTL or deleting data as it gets older. And in that case, like if all the data is in a block is, 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 has, was created within the same timestamp or the same time range, when I do that pruning, the whole block gets blown away and then I can recycle it. Yeah. If it's all intermixed, then I end up deleting some tuples that are five months old and some other tuples that are three months old, they have to stay. Now I, now I have a bunch of holes. Okay. Yeah. Again, for compression, assuming we want to keep all our data, compression is we want, we want a block of data that is never going to be updated again. We could still do it if we need to. Right? We have to support that, but it's unlikely to be updated. So therefore, we can use heavyweight compression to, to reduce its size. And then if anybody tries to update it, we'll, we'll take care of it, but we want to avoid that. So if all, it's all the same size, it, it, it won't be updated again. Or it's all created around the same time, it won't be updated uh, again in the future. All right, so compaction again is basic idea is we're finding these empty blocks, uh, sorry, blocks that have holes in them. All right, this one's half full, this one's half full. Rather than having two half full blocks, I combine them together into one uh, full, uh, uh, full block. So ideally, again, this is what I was saying before, if, if, the, if the tuples are likely to be accessed together uh, in the same window of time, we want to put them in the same block because when we compress them, you know, the likelihood that one of them will be updated and the other ones won't be, will be low. Right? There's another technique we can talk about later on the semester is like, if we now also know that this, this data is very unlikely, not only is it not likely to be updated, it's also unlikely to be read, then we can start shoving it out the disk, right? And start saving memory space. We still keep track of some information in memory so that if you try to read it, we'll go fetch it from disk. But, uh, you know, it's, it's still, but it's, it's primary location is out on disk. And the idea here is that at the beginning of the semester, I said, like, we want to be in memory, assume everything's in memory, and we can run fast. But this is sort of bringing back the disk in an intelligent way and say, well, some data can be shoved out. Most of the time, we're going to be in memory. But if we never spill a disk, we can handle that. So I think we covered that on the, the second and last lecture. The idea, again, it's like we're not bringing back our buffer pool because that's slow. It's just sort of secondary storage. All right, so the three ways we can figure out how to do what's compact. Right? We can just go look at the timestamp since the, last, the tuple was last updated. We already have that information because we're storing the begin timestamp for every single tuple. Right? And we just look at that and say, well, these things are all roughly around the same time. So we go ahead and, and use that to figure out that we can go ahead and remove things. Or, or uh, yeah, to, to consolidate and compaction. The other approach is to look at the last time it was accessed. Because right? again, it's, if a tuple was accessed now at, at some timestamp, more re the more recent it was accessed, the likelihood to be accessed again in the near future is greater than if, if it was accessed a long time ago. Right? So it sort of has a decay effect. For this one, if you're doing timestamp ordering, the basic timestamp ordering protocol with a read timestamp where you're recording every time the thing was read, then you can use that. Otherwise, you have to maintain some additional metadata, maybe at, at a block level, because it would be too expensive to, to maintain this, the access timestamp on a per tuple basis. Because now every single read is, is going to turn into a write because you have to update this, this timestamp. A third approach, which as far as I know, nobody actually does this, but a bunch of people want to do this, is if you can infer some information about what the data actually, uh, how data is related to each other across tables or within the same table, then you can then maybe combine or come back together things that are going to be accessed together uh, uh, more frequently in the same block, because then you can apply the same compaction or compression scheme you want on that. So a foreign key would be an obvious example of this. If I know if I have uh, two tables that have a foreign key, then the likelihood that I'm going to access the parent table and then follow the foreign key and get go to the child table is very high. So maybe I want to put those guys together, close together in memory, so I, I can do compaction and compression together. 
Or another, uh, another example I heard once was um, it was an order processing system where they wanted to keep everything in memory but then shoved, shoved cold orders out to disk. But if the order status of this, of this, of this record, of this, this order, was, was marked as open, which could be open for months, at some later point, they're going to come and access it again. So if I can learn that if the order status equals open, keep it in memory or keep it at these locations, anything that the order status closed got shoved off to another location, then I can, I can do this kind of optimizations. OK? All right. Uh, in the sake of time, I think we already talked about truncate. right? Basically, truncate is, is, is like a delete without a where clause. Delete everything. Run your garbage collection when, once you know everything is, is not visible, and then recreate the table. So we'll talk about this in a week or two about transactional catalogs. So the catalog again is storing the metadata about what tables exist, what, what, what attributes or columns do they have. So if your catalog is transactional, meaning if I call drop table, uh, then anybody that has a timestamp before my drop table transaction can still see the table. And then once they're all gone, I can reclaim the space. So if this is all transactional, then doing this, uh, doing this, this truncation approach is super easy. Same thing actually with compaction, right? Compaction is what? Compaction is taking two blocks and combining them together. We're just moving the physical location of those tuples in those blocks into a new location. So it's like, it's like, a, it's like a delete followed by an insert. So if I can do that transactionally, then I don't worry about any false negatives or false positives from transactions that are running at the same time I'm running compaction. So in our system, our, our, uh, our catalog is entirely transactional and it makes all this stuff easy. We just, we just haven't done it all of it yet. All right. So to finish up, again, the, this is just more of the classic trade-off we see in computer science and in databases of storage versus compute. So you can be more aggressive in doing garbage collection and reclaim more memory space, uh, but that's going to slow down our transactions. Right? Or we can let our, versions, our old versions accumulate, and that could you know, save our uh, computational cycles, but we're spending more memory or spending more storage space to handle this. Right? And so in talking with people that are running MVC systems, especially in-memory systems, Everybody is willing to pay a penalty for performance in exchange for reducing the memory footprint. And I want to take a guess why. What's more expensive? RAM. RAM. RAM's more expensive. Not only more expensive to buy, but also more expensive to maintain because you have to pay energy for this. So if I can run my database a little bit slower but use a lot less memory, uh, then I can, you know, that, that can be a big cost savings. So that's why I like the, the, the hype approach in the, in the paper you guys read from Steam because they're running the, the garbage collection as they're running queries. The queries run slower, but they're reclaiming things as, as soon as possible and, and reducing the memory footprint. Okay? All right, any questions about GC? All right, tips for profiling. Okay. So I, assuming, I don't know, at some point you might have covered this kind of information. I don't think 2.13 covers this. Uh, but this is sort of be a, it's a reoccurring theme throughout the semester of like, all right, we want to determine whether our system is running slow, and then if, if slow, if, if so, why? So let's look at a really simple example here. I have two functions, foo and bar, in my program. All right? So I want, to, I want to speed it up. I want to figure out how to get, why these guys are running slower, and what can I do to figure out you know, how, to, how, how to make them run faster. So a really stupid way to do this would be, or naive way to do this, would be run our program in, in a debugger, GDB or whatever LLDB for, for, for Apple. And every so often, we just hit pause on the program, look at the stack trace, figure out what function it's, it's in, and just record that. And every so often, just keep hitting pause and record this information. And then over time, I would have uh, information about what, what function was being called the most. Right? It's stupid, but it would work, right? So let's say that uh, I did this, and I got 10 call, uh, call stack samples, and then six out of the 10 times I did that pause and looked, they were in the function foo, right? So we would know that, based, based on the, our measurements, that roughly 60% 60, 60 of our time of our program was spent in this foo function. Now obviously the accuracy of this, of this calculation would increase the more time I hit pause. Like if I, if I get like a little motor and hit pause over and over again, I could automate this. Right? I could get more samples and they have a more, uh, you know, more accurate measurement, right? So now, say f we're, most of the time we're running foo, and so this should be our target of, of what we sh should optimize first, right? We have two functions, foo and bar. We should optimize foo first because most of their time is being spent in that, 
So let's say now we're able to uh, make foo run two times faster. What would be the expected overall improvement of, of, of our system? Who here has seen Amdahl's law before? Eh, less than half. Okay. So Amdahl's law is a way to calculate what the expected improvement will be if we know what percentage of our program is spent in, in, a, in a particular function or a different part of the code. So if we make this thing go 2% faster, or sorry, 2x faster, and we know that 60% of our time is, is spent in foo, then we can cut this time in half, but we're still spending 4% of our time in this, in this function bar. So Amdahl's law gives us this nice formula that would tell us the overall expected speed up based on our distribution of the functions that we're invoking and the speed up we, we expect to get, right? We run, we plug and chug the math and we'd say that we would get a 1.4 times improvement. So even though I made that function, which is called the majority of the time, 2x faster, the overall system speed up is only 1.4x. So we can use Amdahl's law as a way to figure out when we look at our, look at our, our database system, where are we spending our time and how much effort is it going to be to make that particular function go faster uh, and we can then do a back of the envelope calculation to decide what should be the improvement we expect to see. And it's sometimes useful to do this right, when you're doing, um, you know, as you're doing uh, you know, performance pro profiling and, and development because if my function is not that called that often then it, I probably don't want to uh, improve it. Um, but it's, it's not how many times it's called, it has how much time I'm spending in it. So I can use that to figure out what are the, sort of the high poles in the tent, what are the, what are the parts of the system that we're spending most of our time in and those are the things we should target to improve it, but as we assess how to improve it, we can use this form to decide, well, if I think I can get it to be 2x faster, what is the real benefit I'm going to get from that? <coughs> right? and it's, sort of, it's, a, it's an old adage in, in systems, you want to avoid premature optimizations. So yes, there might be a fancy new lock-free algorithm we could use for some part of the system all right, that could be better than what we have now, but if that part of the code is, is not executed that often, then we're just wasting our time. There's other things we should worry about. All right, so now we need to figure out how can we actually get this information. So my little example of hitting pause over and over again on my keyboard is stupid, right? But there's actually real tools that, that'll do this for us. So the two main ones that we're going to focus on is Valgrind and Callgrind and Perf. So Valgrind is, an, is a heavyweight instrumentation framework that is basically going to inject, uh, inject things into the binary as it's running that allows it to collect information about what part of the system that, that it's in. And so this will make your program run slower, but you know, th this will be, um, it'll be I mean, and you still do sampling, otherwise it'll go too slow, but like, this will actually show you, the, yeah. This will tell you within at the code level where you're spending your time. This will sort of say things at like a hardware level. So perf is a way to get out the, the low level performance counters from that Intel provides on x86 and record things like how many cycles I'm spending on like, individual lines of, of assembly instruction or, or, or code. So both of these can be used for different things. This one will give you lower level information like cache misses, uh, cycle counts, whereas this one just tells you like instruction counts for... for uh, but this tells you instructions counts because it doesn't know how long it actually spent in, in, the, in the CPU, whereas perf will give you, give you that. So you actually want to use both, but I'll, I'll give a demo of perf. All right, so again, Valgrind, is actually a, a, a toolkit, a bunch of other uh, uh, things we can use. Memcheck is a way to check for memory errors. Uh, this, I think what, this is what the original version of Valgrind was. This is checks for things like if you, if you have memory leaks and things like that, it'll find those things. We use uh, address sanitizers as part of uh, Clang or GCC from Google, and it's a more lightweight of identifying these things. Call grind, it will show you where you're spending your time in the source code. And then Massive is a way to show you sort of within the total heap space of uh, the address space of your process, what parts of the, the, you know, of, of the program is allocating the most amount of memory. And obviously for us, the database portion will always be larger, the largest, but within that we can drill down and say like how much time, we're, you know, how much space we're spending for the data structures to keep track of things and, and indexes and other stuff. Right? When, we, when we first built the BW tree, uh, it was allocating a lot of memory when, when you turned the thing on. And when you looked at massive, like even though you put zero data in onto the table, the, it would show this huge you know, this block of memory being spent for the BW tree because it, it allocated a mapping table for no reason or without actually using it yet. All right, so let's see how to use call grind. So for call grind, I, I think you need to have root privileges because you're instrumenting the binary. Um, and so you can use this on the command line. For this one, I'm, there's, a, there's instructions on the wiki how to compile uh, in release mode 
without asserts, but maintain the debug symbols so that when you look at the, the, the trace in call grind or kcache grind, it'll show you like here's the source code or here, you know, here's the function call, here's the line number in the source code that maintains this information. So this compiling under this mode will, will, will maintain all that simple information but without all the extra asserts that'll slow the system down. So it'll be close as you can get to actually running the, the real system. The other thing too is here, this is a, uh, I pushed this to the, the project one um, branch last night, but now you can pass in through an environment variable how many threads you want to run uh, the benchmark with. So by default, if you just run slot iterator benchmark, it'll give you one thread. You can set this to say how many, how many threads you want to use. And remember, for, for identifying what the bottleneck is, it won't show up if you have one thread. It'll show up when you have more threads. Right? It'll be really obvious. So you want to run with a higher thread count. And so, so you run this for a bit, and then it'll spit out this uh, call grind file. And then there's tools like kcache grind that'll give you a nice visualization and breakdown of, of what's calling what. So this is actually from the benchmark that we gave students last year, but the, the high level idea is the same. So in here, you can see the community distribution time where at sort of at the top of the call stack within, within the system, you know, what percentage of the time you're spending in these different function calls. And then this is a nice call graph view that you can drill down and say, well, for this function, it invoked this function you know, a, a million times, but I spent 0.34% of my total time in this. Right? I spent 9% here, but I invoked it 9 million times. So you can drill down and see like, what function I'm actually spending the most time on. Right? But again, this is showing you, this is like invocations and just uh, and wall clock time. It's not going to show you the, the cycle count, which uh, is going to be useful as well. All right, so perf again, that's collecting the low-level performance counters that for, from, from Linux that the x86 provides you. I think Mac should still work. I think it should. I don't have a Mac, so I haven't tried it, but this should still work. Um, if it doesn't, we'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. Um, but so basically, there's a bunch of different things, you, uh, events you can collect from the, from the hardware about your process that's running, um, and then you can set how, how often you want to sample. Right, so this, this is going to sample every 2,000 occurrences of the event. And then as you run, it's going to record this in this perf.data file that gets generated uh, when you, when, you know, after your program not, runs. So for this one, this one you definitely have to run under root permissions because you're asking at low-level hardware to get these hardware counters. And it's something that the OS normally doesn't provide you because you can do it for any, any process that's running. Right? So basically what happens is like, there's these internal counters in the hardware. And then when they go to a certain amount, Right, based on, on the, on the uh, event counter, then it rec records a sample. Right? And it contains all the information about, about the you know, individual lines of code and actually at the assembly level of what called what. And again, you want to compile this with release mode with debug symbols so that when you look at the perf output, it'll show you the actual lines of code. Yes? So like uh, this bottleneck that we have to identify it won't show on our local system. We have to run it on Amazon, right? I, it, it, what will happen is, uh, if you run with a lower, we, we can do a demo if we have time. On a lower core count, what the bottleneck is may not appear because everyone's not hitting it. On the higher core count, it definitely shows up, and it'd be really obvious. So we have to run it on Amazon, right? You can try it on your laptop first. I mean, I'll, I'll show you right now actually what it is. It's, not, not, it's, it's a latch, right? It's not, not a mystery, right? <laughs> in end and plus plus. Right? In what? In end and plus plus. In the slot editor, yes. Yes. Right, so anyway, so you run this. If you run perf, uh, I think I tried this this morning. If you run with a higher core count, a uh, higher thread count, it takes a long time, and the, and the benchmark won't even finish, and the file is like 10 gigs. So you, I'll show you, you can kill it off early. Um, and then there's nice uh, third-party visualization tools that are called Hotspot. It's for Linux. I don't know if it works on a Mac. That I'll give you like flame graphs and show you things that are, more, that are a bit easier to read than like the perf tool. But let me give you a quick demo. All right, are we in? All right, so, so this is, uh, again, I compiled this with debug info. This is just H top at the bottom. This is the machine we have in the lab with 40 cores. So uh, I've already set the environment variable. Actually, no, I did not do that. Let me log back in, sorry. So again, I'm setting the environment variable, tear your benchmark threads to 16, 
and that'll guarantee that uh, that'll make it run with 16 threads. So again, here I'm going to run the slot. I'm going to run perf the slot iterator benchmark. I'm going to record cycle counts, and I'm going to collect samples every 2,000, and then just, this is just the binary that I'm going to run. Right, and then this is just showing me at the bottom, right, that it, it, it shot that I'm using uh, I'm using 16 cores as expected, right. So again. I'm maxing at a, out at 100% a, at a because there's a bottleneck in their system where they're trying to do something over and over again, but they're not actually getting, making forward progress. They're not actually getting work done. So even though it looks like my utilization is fantastic, it's actually crap because it's, it, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on this bottleneck. So again, this could run forever, uh, run for a long time and, and take a while. So you can go at control C and kill it. It'll tell you how many times that it, uh, it got woken up for some data. And then the perf trace was, uh, 32 megs. Again, for only running a few seconds, it got to 32 megs. So now, I can run, the, I can run perf report. Actually, here. Yeah, so in, in my directory, it'll generate this perf.data file, right? So after you run perf, it'll spit that out. So if I run perf report, again, you have to be root for this, right? It'll process the file and then give you a, uh, give you a, a list of where, where you're spending all your time for your, in your program. And because again, I ran with debug symbols on, I can see everything. So lo and behold, if I look at the very top for the slot iterator benchmark, uh, I'm spending 48, 49% of my time in some function here and then 45% of my time in the other function here. So the rest is, is, is just where it actually did work. So this is, this is obviously the bottleneck. So what you can do is you can drill down, perf has a nice tool, you can drill down into this, you can say annotate the slot iterator plus plus operator, and then now I see source code, and I can drill down to see that I'm spending 94% of my time uh, for this function in this test operator. And because what am I doing? I'm trying to, trying to acquire a spin latch. So I'm spinning on this latch, trying to acquire it, and that's why I spent 94% of my time on that. Right? That's the bottleneck. And I can go back, I think it's escape, and see the other one. Annotate. Now I'm spending 91% of my time on the same, on the same uh, spin latch. TDB is thread building blocks. This is the library we use from Intel to provide us the, the spin latch. It's actually a pretty good implementation. But again, it's like anything. Like if, you, if you use it incorrectly, then you're going to have problems. So even though it's a great implementation of a spin latch, if you have it uh, in a contention point, it's going to be slow. Okay? So I will send out a link. There's this great video. It's like an hour long about um, how to use perf uh, a bit further. Again, this is the same thing I showed you. Uh, there's nice tools that'll give you flame graphs like this, but for this one, it's pretty obvious, okay? And there's a bunch of other events you can get back, a bunch of links here. All right, so next class, we'll, we'll pick up on indexes. We'll spend a little time at the beginning talking about tea trees because they're interesting from a historical perspective. We'll spend most of our time talking about a, a lat tree index, the, he, in, uh, the, B, the BW tree from Microsoft, and then we'll talk about how to do version latching for B plus trees, okay? Any questions? Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't with that beer called the OE because I'm OG. Ice Cube down with the STI. You looked and it was gone. Grab me a 40 just to get my buzz on because I needed just a little more kick. Hooked like a fish after just one sip. Yo. Put it to my lips and rip the top off. A ball just dropped off. This ain't eyes hopped off and my hood won't be the same. After Ice Cube, take a say I. Yeah.